so welcome everyone to my talk about open source project health. Uh, as Ruth just mentioned, if you have questions, drop them into the Q&A because I will pause periodically to answer questions throughout the talk. So um, I won't necessarily save them all to the end so that we can talk about whatever you all find interesting. I wanted to do this talk because companies make really big bets on open source technologies, but how can we figure out which projects will continue to be healthy and viable? Like with most things in life, there are no sure bets, right? But there are ways that we can evaluate these projects and understand the risks that we're taking and see if we can maybe minimize or mitigate some of those risks. And this is what I'm gonna talk about today. But first, I will tell you a little bit about me. I've spent more than 20 years working in the technology industry. And most of that time I've been working on open source projects from within a pretty wide variety of companies. I was director of community at Puppet. I was community lead for Intel's open source technology center. Before the VMware acquisition of Pivotal, I was responsible for driving Pivotal's Kubernetes contribution strategy, and I was actively contributing to, the, uh, to Kubernetes within the contributor experience SIG. I also have a PhD from the University of Greenwich in London that I got by researching how people working at a bunch of different companies collaborate within the Linux kernel. So now I'm working in VMware's open source program office and I'm responsible for our open source community strategy. So lately I've been a lot more active in the CNCF contributor strategy SIG, in particular the governance working group. I'm also a board member of Open UK, which is focused on developing and sustaining leadership in open technology here within the UK. I'm a governing board member and maintainer for the Linux Foundation's Chaos Project which you'll see a lot in this talk. They're focused on using metrics to evaluate the health of open source projects. And I'm also on the advisory board for Paturgia, which is a company focused on open source project health metrics. As I said before, I have, I have a lot to talk about during this presentation, but I will pause periodically and answer your questions. So type your questions into the Q&A as you think of them and I'll get to as many as I can in the time allotted. Most of us bet large portions of our business on open source technologies, but how do we decide which projects will continue to be healthy and viable? I try to evaluate project health in terms of risk rather than making a judgment of whether something's good or bad. And certainly there are no sure bets, right? But there are ways that we can evaluate these projects and we can decide which projects are maybe more likely to be successful and understand the risks that are associated with those projects. First of all, the community can make or break an open source project. And the overall success of a project often depends on the community. This is usually the first thing I look at when trying to decide if an open source project is healthy or not. Is the community active and engaged in productive discussions around the project? Are they helpful when people have questions or problems? Are they welcoming for new contributors and for new users? One of the reasons that Kubernetes has been so successful is because people truly enjoy participating in that community. From the beginning in Kubernetes, I felt welcomed. The people were fun and there were plenty of opportunities to step in and help out. Kubernetes also has loads of resources, documentation, and training for new contributors, along with mentoring programs, which helps people get started and want to continue participating. If the community isn't amazing, this is a risk. It doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't get involved or use the software, but you should approach it with caution and understand that there is a risk that things could go terribly wrong with that project as a whole if things get even worse within the community and the contributors just start disappearing. Another key indicator of project health is responsiveness to community contributions. If you're actively using an open source project, it's likely that you will, you'll find bugs or want to contribute fixes back upstream. 
So you want to make sure that maintainers and other contributors typically respond in a timely fashion. Seeing large numbers of issues and pull requests on a project is a red flag for me because it can indicate that either they don't have enough contributors to handle the incoming contributions or even worse, that they don't actually care about or want contributions from others. Now, out of these two scenarios, not having enough contributors to respond to pull requests and issues is probably the more common one. And most projects I've worked on have struggled with keeping up at one time or another. It's not uncommon. In some cases, you can help solve this problem by making contributions to open source projects part of the job for some of your employees. However, there are legitimately some projects that don't actually want contributions from people outside of their company or outside of their existing circle of maintainers. This can happen when a project was open sourced for the wrong reasons, like politics or marketing, without buy-in from the people who are responsible for that project. These projects are much higher risk since you're less likely to get any changes incorporated in the upstream project that you might need in the future. And responsiveness is one of the key metrics that I use to look at whether the open source projects we've created at VMware are healthy. And I have some examples of how I do this on the next couple of slides. Our guidance for open source projects is that they should respond within two business days at the most to new issues and pull requests on any projects that we start within VMware. And I think that this is a pretty good guideline for many projects. The reality is that a lot of our pull requests and issues get responses in a matter of minutes or hours instead of days, especially if they come in when the maintainers and other contributors are actively working on the project. Now, this is an example from the TURN project, and you can see the black line on top or green where the lines overlap, which is the total number of pull requests that are open in each month. So you compare that line to the green line, which shows the number of pull requests that were responded to in less than two business days. This one looks really good. There was a slightly larger gap in March and April where some pull requests were lingering for maybe more than two business days. And it looks like one of those months were just under that 90% threshold that I set. And I always expect to see a month where things slip a little, even for healthy projects, even very healthy projects, because people are distracted. They've got other projects, conferences, maybe they want to take a vacation and you could set any thresholds you wanted but for me, 10% wiggle room and five out of six months is what seems reasonable uh, for me for our projects. Now, in addition to looking at the time to first response, I also look at whether our projects are keeping up with pull requests and closing them in a timely manner. And I think it's important to look at closed pull requests rather than just merged pull requests when measuring project health because there will always be some pull requests that shouldn't be merged. They just should not be merged for a variety of different reasons. And I like to see that a project also closes PRs that won't be merged in a timely fashion, rather than just letting them linger in limbo because it can be hard to tell people that their contribution won't ever be merged. Now again, the, the line on this graph, so it's a black line, but it's overlaid with the green line, shows the total number of pull requests that are open in a given month. And the green line where it dips below shows the number of pull requests that were closed in that month. Now I see a little gap here in August for the turn project, but I also happen to know that one of the key contributors uh, is off on maternity leave, which is, as far as I'm concerned, a pretty great excuse for neglecting some pull requests. And for all of our metrics, I'm really careful to identify projects that don't hit these thresholds as at risk, not unhealthy. The thresholds that I set, again, seem reasonable for most of my projects, but admittedly, they're, they're a bit arbitrary, right? So they might not be ideal for certain types of projects. And additionally, some projects might have really very good reasons for not always meeting these goals based on other priorities or other commitments. I think we don't always spend enough time thinking about contributor risk associated with many open source projects. This is sometimes called the bus factor, which is a bit macabre. So I've heard other people frame this in terms of winning the lottery, which is obviously way more positive than being hit by a bus. 
And what this means is that for any open source projects you rely on, are there enough contributors that if one of them won the lottery and retired on a beach tomorrow, could the project continue with minimal disruptions? This is a bigger risk for projects that are highly complex or contain technologies that require really specialized expertise. The risk might be much lower for small projects using technologies that could easily be picked up for most developers. The biggest example of this uh, was a couple of years ago when it was discovered OpenSSL had a security bug in their cryptography library referred to as Heartbleed. So if you're in the last session, uh, Duane and Carol also talked about this example because it's a pretty great example for a lot of reasons. But OpenSSL is a technology that almost every company in the world uses in, in one way or another. And it was during this crisis that most of us learned that OpenSSL, the foundation, received about $2,000 in donations per year and was maintained uh, kind of mostly by a single person with a second person also contributing. Yes, uh, that is indeed right. Software that's used by almost everyone had really no resources to maintain the software over the long term. And there are probably hundreds or thousands of other open source projects in the same or similar situations. Now, in this case, the Linux Foundation got some companies together to fund the core infrastructure initiative to provide funding for people to work on OpenSSL and similar projects on a full-time basis. And I know VMware and other companies have also started contributing in particular to OpenSSL, but also other projects. You should also look at organizational diversity as a part of the health and risk for open source projects. If all or most of the contributions are from employees at a single company, what happens when that company has a shift in strategy? or they get acquired, or even worse, they run out of money and go out of business. Would the project be able to continue if the company pulled all of its employees out of the project? Again, this comes down to risk and whether you as a company are willing to take on that risk. Again, these thresholds are a bit arbitrary, but if you look at the top few contributors, I like to see that we have at least three people that are making more than 70% of the commits over the past year, or at least 70% of the commits over the last year. This data is from the Harbor repo within the Harbor project, which we contributed to the CNCF a while back. And it has a great balance of contributions from quite a few different people. And this is admittedly a fairly rudimentary way of measuring contributor risk, which works well enough for what I need. But for really big projects, you might want to measure this for different areas within the code base to make sure that you have good coverage across the entire project so that each key area has a reasonable contributor risk. While I do like to see three or more people making most of the contributions, um, this is another example from the TURN project, but this is, this is probably okay because this is a relatively small project and it does have two active contributors. And if you look at TURN, it's a container inspection tool. It's written mostly in Python. So it would be something that could be picked up by other people if one of these two won the lottery and disappeared on us. But there's also a good balance between these two at 42% and 35%. So it's not just one person making most of the contributions. But more importantly, I like to look at contributor risk as an opportunity for mentoring and for bringing more people into the project. When there are only a couple of contributors doing most of the work, this is a good opportunity to think about other people within the company or within the project who could be encouraged and mentored into taking on a larger role within the project. Measuring organizational diversity is really important, but, but it is also one of the most difficult project health measurements to actually get right. If everyone used corporate email addresses, this would be a lot easier. But many people contribute from personal email addresses, sometimes multiple personal email addresses. And we work in an industry where job changes are pretty frequent. So you may think you know where someone works, um, but they might have changed jobs when you weren't looking. And you probably want to continue to attribute their past work to their old company, while the new contributions are attributed to the new company. And all of this means that it requires quite a bit of work, often manual work, in order to get the affiliation data into a state where it's actually useful. It's pretty common to see graphs like the one on the slide with almost all of the contributions attributed to other 
or unknown or none if the data hasn't been properly cleaned up. So this is the long way of saying, I haven't done this yet for, our, for my metrics. I'm still working on cleaning up the data so that I can implement organizational diversity in my Augur-based metrics. But here's an example from the Cloud Foundry Irene project, since the Cloud Foundry affiliation data is actually pretty good. And this makes for a fairly simple example. This one in particular looks, looks pretty good. There, there are two companies who are making a lot of the contributions with a couple of other companies who are also involved. Uh, which is fine given you know that this is a relatively small project it's a bit more worrying and higher risk when almost all of the contributions are coming from a single company especially if it's a small company another thing that i look for when assessing the risk of open source projects is whether they make regular releases and quickly patch security vulnerabilities projects that take a proactive approach to addressing security issues and releasing fixes are much more likely to be secure. Ideally, the project should have a security.md file or another document with details about the process for rep reporting and responding to security concerns. You can also look at whether they use automated tools like Dependabot, for example, to help identify when new versions of dependencies are available, which also helps keep on top of potential security issues. And while there are, there are no guarantees, like with anything, and critical security issues can sort of pop up at any time. These are relatively good indicators that the project at least takes a proactive approach to security, which reduces the risk of security issues. For our projects, I like to see at least one release per month, more than that for larger projects like Harbor in this case. Most projects have release schedules where they do big releases every few months. And those are the ones that you hear about and everyone talks about. So when I'm talking about measuring release frequency, I'm not talking about those big, big releases. I'm, I'm looking at all of the little point releases that happen in between those big releases that everyone talks about. Since that's where things like bug fixes for security issues often realistically, that's where they often land. And like with other measurements, these are again, subjective thresholds uh, that I think seem to work for most of our projects. But for some very small projects with you know, fewer releases might be fine if they don't have a lot of dependencies. And for larger projects with a load of dependencies, you probably want to see more point releases. And again, this all comes down to how much risk you want to accept as a company and as a project. Diversity and inclusion is also something that I look at for project health. Now this one, this one's a lot harder to measure and it usually involves mostly a manual assessment but we have defined some metrics within the Chaos Project's diversity and inclusion working group that you should have a look at for ideas about measuring various aspects of diversity and inclusion. You know, first, does the project have a code of conduct that contains details on how it's enforced and how to report incidents? The code of conduct should also apply to all behavior across the entire project and not just at events. Looking at the project's events though, can shed quite a bit of light on diversity and inclusion. Do they have a diverse set of speakers from a variety of genders and from underrepresented folks? And if so, are diverse voices represented in the keynotes and across a variety of tracks? For example, if all of your diverse speakers are in some kind of DNI track, um, I wouldn't necessarily call that a win, right, for your project. I also look at whether they have things like diversity access tickets to allow more people to attend? Do they have gender neutral restrooms if it's an in-person event? And is it a family friendly environment with you know, childcare for attendees so that more people can actually be included and attend the event? I also look at does the project have diverse leadership from the very top? Are there mentoring programs and other ways for diverse folks to move into those leadership positions? Projects that make a concerted effort to bring in new people from a variety of backgrounds and have programs in place to help them grow into leadership positions, there are more likely to benefit from increased innovation and are more likely to have a healthier community. And all of these things make the project less risky. So let's, let's pause here for just a sec to see if anyone has any questions about project health and risk before we dive into the topic of ownership. I don't see any questions in the Q&A. Oops. 
Uh, so, hi, Don. I oh, there's... see one from Melissa on the chat. Mm, so, um, should I read it out? Yes, please. Okay, so she's curious. How would you um, evaluate non-foundation backed projects, um, example, frameworks and languages in terms of velocity, since uh, most of them do not have, oh shit, I actually went off. Sorry, let me just get that again. Uh, okay, since, okay, so let me take it again. So she's curious. How do you evaluate non-foundation backed projects, example with frameworks and languages, in terms of velocity? Since most of them do not have full-time maintainers, I suspect their velocity wouldn't meet the thresholds, but are critical for app development. You got that? Yeah. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, Melissa, yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, and I do certainly think so. So the thresholds that I've set seem to be working for most of the VMware projects that have um, that have a certain amount of velocity. So these these thresholds actually don't don't work uh, for smaller projects, which is uh, I think what you're what you're pointing out, and that's absolutely true. So I actually only run these metrics on projects that have at least sixty commits over the past six months, so at least ten commits per month. So it catches relatively small projects. But I do think that for for some projects, these these measurements probably probably just aren't appropriate. Um, and so I think one of the things that I would look at, especially for um, for smaller projects that maybe you know don't get as much activity, but that are really important, you know, I think you can still look at their velocity. But I think that there are probably other things that are going to be more important. So I would I would look at the things that that matter to you. And knowing that the thing about metrics is that uh, you measure different things depending on what your goals are. So for something like this, that's more of a more of a framework or a language, the, the goals are gonna be different. So you'd probably want to measure different things. Okay, I am going to, I'm going to keep going. Uh, let's see if I can get rid of the... You might want to... I, I see one more, but you, you can keep going. Oh, no, go ahead. I, I don't, sorry, I just didn't see it. Okay, so it's from Ari. Uh, it said, if a project doesn't meet your diversity and inclusion requirement, for example, not having a code of conduct, is this something you bring up to maintainers and encourage them to fix? Um, yes, uh, in particular, the area of, of code of conduct. And I can't remember if I'm gonna talk about that later. I think I might, but the two things that I would say are absolutely critical is the project has to have a code of conduct and it should be properly licensed under an open source license. If you're going to contribute to an open source project, it should be properly licensed. Um, those are also things that if, if the project is amenable to it, you can help them um, fix this, right? So if they don't have a code of conduct, you can help them put one in place. And I think that that's, that's perfectly reasonable. Um, if they really don't want a code of conduct and they're super hostile to that discussion, I would, I would probably run away from that project unless there was, um, I would probably run away from that project. Uh, you know, it's, it's a matter of business risk, but, but projects like that are, are pretty difficult. Okay, so now I will keep going. Um, can't see, all right. You can see the slide, right? Because my slide is overlaid with the Q&A, but I think you you can probably see it. Yeah, um, ownership and so, weeks. Okay, perfect. So before we dive into some of the details of project governance, I wanted to talk about why it's important to think about who owns or controls an open source project and how that relates to risk. Because it's something that many of us, I think don't spend as much time thinking about as we probably should. With the recent announcement of the Open Usage Commons Foundation, I've been thinking a lot about what it means for a foundation to be neutral and why foundations can be important for collaborative leadership within open source projects. The success of Kubernetes can be attributed in part to being contributed to the Cloud, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, the CNCF. Putting Kubernetes into a neutral foundation 
with representation from a bunch of different companies really leveled the playing field where each of us could collaborate and innovate as equals to create something that benefits the entire ecosystem. Our end users get access to more innovation from a diverse group of contributors while also reducing vendor lock-in. For example, users of Kubernetes can consume enterprise versions from a wide variety of different vendors that run on any of the leading cloud providers. And as software vendors, we can contribute to foundation-driven projects with the confidence that no one single company is in control of the project and that we can contribute as equals within the community. Open source projects that are controlled by a single company are higher risk because they operate at the whims of that company. Whereas projects that are under neutral foundations have a much lower risk, both for end users and for software, uh, software vendors. When a project is owned by a company, there's little recourse for outside contributors when that company decides to go in a different direction that doesn't necessarily align with the needs or the expectations of those other participants. When a project is owned or controlled by a company, consider the reputation of that company as a steward for open source projects. But always keep in mind that they can change their strategy at some later date. Uh, frankly, we've seen some of this with Google around the Istio and Knative projects over the past year or so. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't participate in open source projects owned by other companies. This is just an assessment of risk. And in some cases, it makes a lot of sense to accept this higher risk. But we should at least try to make sure that as a company, we understand the risks that we're taking. At VMware, we believe that contributing open source projects to neutral foundations is important. And it's something that we do regularly for projects that have started once they gain a bit of traction with people outside of the company. For example, we contributed Harbor and Contour to the CNCF. We contributed Turn to the Linux Foundation's Automated Compliance Tooling Project. We've also contributed projects to the Apache Software Foundation and other foundations. And by contributing projects to neutral foundations, this reduces the risks associated with the project for other companies who want to contribute to that project. With advantages around community building, innovation, and wider adoption, it's something that we should at least consider for our open source projects. It's also important to think about when your project might be ready to contribute to a neutral foundation. If your project is very immature, foundations are unlikely to be interested in your project. Whereas a project with a whole bunch of users that has really good traction within the ecosystem that just maybe needs some help moving up to the next level is a lot more likely to be accepted. However, companies should understand that contributing a project to a foundation is an ongoing commitment. It is not an exit strategy. And you need to be prepared to provide staff and other support over the long term, just like you would if you weren't contributing it to a foundation and we're going to continue to maintain it internally. Now, again, I'll stop for a pause to see if there are any more questions about ownership before I dive into the topic of governance. Do we have any, let's see, I don't see anything in the Q&A box that hasn't been answered. Is there anything in the chat? No, there's, there's not nope. yet. Okay, I will just keep, I'll keep going. Okay. So we've been doing quite a bit of work within the CNCF Contributor Strategy SIG in the governance working group to help document governance best practices. And this section contains a lot of ideas and inspiration and materials that uh, I've been working on along with people like Josh Berkus, for example, within the governance working group, along with some thoughts on how all of this impacts project risk. Now, a lot of people like to hate on governance. It's just extra paperwork, it's busy work, it's politicking that just gets in the way of doing all of the real work on the project. Now, the reality is that governance can be found in all open source projects in one form or another to specify the processes for how people work together within the project. 
Ideally, it'll be clearly documented, but for some projects, especially smaller ones, it might be a bit more ad hoc and informal. Governance helps outline the expectations around roles and responsibilities, along with the decision-making processes. So it's important for projects to have at least the basics in place early, since it's one of those things that projects may think they don't need until they realize that they really do need it when something goes wrong. It's usually easier when projects set clear expectations up front rather than realizing later that various people have very different expectations, which can require a lot of time to sort out. This doesn't mean that everything should be specified up front, and I would discourage projects from over-engineering their governance processes before they need them. A project with only a few people won't need elaborate elections to select leaders, but they should probably define a few basic roles like maintainer, define the process for contributing to the project and maybe outline how decisions about those contributions are made. If the process for collaboration and decision-making are not clearly documented as a part of the project governance, this can increase the risk of participating in or using the project because it introduces a lot of uncertainty into the mix. Knowing how collaboration occurs and how decisions are made is vital to being able to make contributions that are more likely to be accepted. Um, yeah, this is where I was going to talk about the licensing and the code of conduct. Um, there are a few documents that every project, even the really small ones, should have. It goes without saying, but they need appropriate licensing documentation. I occasionally find repos with missing license files entirely, but that's probably less common. More often, I see licenses not applied correctly within the projects. So in addition to putting a license file in the repository, some licenses require things like a notices file or license headers within each source file. Projects should also, as I mentioned earlier, have a code of conduct that people can easily find with all of the details about how to report incidents along with the consequences of violating that code of conduct. And as I mentioned earlier, if a project is missing either one of these, I would argue that the participating in that project really does pose more risk than I would be willing to accept, both from a legal standpoint and just from the need to have a safe environment for our employees to participate in. And as I mentioned earlier, you can probably help the project resolve some of these issues and eliminate these risks, assuming that they're open to that. The contribution docs should provide enough details about the contribution process so that someone new to the project can make their first contribution. This includes details about how to sign the contributor license agreement or CLA if there is one, or how to use the developer certificate of origin or it's often called a DCO or a signed off by process. If there are strong preferences within the project about coding style, testing, documentation, or other requirements, this is a good opportunity to specify those here and make sure that contributors know them upfront, which helps reduce the burden of trying to educate each individual contributor about the requirements while you're trying to also review their contributions for you know, other things like technical merit, for example. And the better this is documented, the lower the risk will be, since your contributors will know what to expect and how to navigate the project when making contributions. The communication process should also be clearly defined so that people know where and how to communicate within the project. Maybe the project prefers mailing list discussions or Slack messages or issues for feature requests. And maybe there are separate communication channels for users that are separate from the developers. And if everyone understands how people within the project communicate with each other, it avoids frustrating experiences, both for new and for the existing contributors. And again, the better this is documented, the lower the risk, since communication is an important part of participating in any open source project. At a minimum, there should be some kind of documentation about leadership. For small projects, maybe it's Maybe you just need a list of maintainers in a readme file, or maybe owners or maintainers file that indicate which people are responsible for various areas within the project. Defining the roles and responsibilities for contributors can, you know, really, it can really help you because um, 
you'll eventually need to recruit new people into these roles. And if you at least define like contributors, maintainers, reviewers, that, that might be enough as a first step if you're just working on a small project. But for bigger projects, you wanna see more details about the specific roles and responsibilities for the different leadership positions, along with how others can move into those leadership roles. There might be committees, working groups, or other groups that will need leaders. And again, having this documented can really help the project recruit new leaders as it grows and needs more people to share the workload. Ideally, having programs that give people opportunities for shadowing, mentoring, and sponsoring new potential leaders can help grow a diverse set of people into new leadership within the project. If your company is an active participant in a project, you'll want to understand how your contributors can move into leadership roles. Having employees in leadership roles helps reduce your risk as a company since these employees will be in a position to understand more about how the project works and they can help mentor other employees into the project. There are quite a few options for selecting leaders as a part of defining governance. And the ideal is to have a process that provides a fair and level playing field that defines how new contributors can eventually move up and become leaders. This should be documented so that all participants can clearly understand the criteria and the process for moving both into and then again out of leadership positions. Most of the bigger projects like Kubernetes have an election process, at least for the top levels of leadership like a steering committee. At the lower levels of leadership, many projects have a process where existing leaders select the new ones. For example, new maintainers are often nominated by existing maintainers and approved after a certain number of maintainers agree, or sometimes via a vote by maintainers or committee members. So um, there are loads of options for deciding this. So I won't try to cover all of them here, but the slide has a link with uh, more details about how to select leaders. The key is having a fair process for selecting leaders, like elections, for example. And it reduces your risk of participating since your contributors can participate in the elections. They can have a say in the governance of the project. Higher risk options would include organizational leadership seats where a certain number of positions are allocated to specific companies where those companies get to decide who their leadership positions, uh, which employees get those leadership positions. And there's no easy way for new leaders who work outside of those companies to move into those positions. Most business decisions boil down to an assessment of risk and making trade-offs and decisions about which open source projects you should use or participate in. And open source is no different. You have to evaluate the risk. And I've talked a lot about the risks associated with various elements within open source projects. You also need to think about the project risks along with how you're using a project within your business. If you're building your entire product line on top of some open source technology, you probably want it to be relatively low risk. If you're using an open source project as some tiny little part of some non-critical infrastructure, you can probably accept more risk. It's probably just not that important. Now, no project is all good or all bad, all risk or no risk, and no one solution will be right for every single situation. Project risk, like most things, exists on a continuum. And you need to think about the risks you might be taking. You should communicate those risks to decision makers, uh, executives in some cases, and then make informed decisions as a company about which risks to accept. Deciding which risks you're going to take is the beginning of the process, not the end, since you should also think about how you might want to monitor and maybe mitigate some of those risks if needed based on changing business needs. I will wrap up the talk with a few resources that people might find useful. The to-do group has a bunch of guides that have great information about creating and managing healthy projects and measuring success. The CNCF contributor strategy SIG has several working groups and we're in the process of building out some useful docs. 
The Contributor Growth Working Group, for example, has a doc about project health, uh, which I wrote most of, so I think it's pretty great. And the Governance Working Group has more details about what you need for governance and some options for leadership selection. The Chaos Community, of course, has many tools and a whole bunch of metrics to find that can be used to measure open source project health. And these are all really great starting places for understanding project health and the associated risks of using open source projects. So with that, thank you so much for, for coming to my talk. And I, it looks like I have about four and a half minutes for any additional Q&A. So I will look at the Q&A. I don't see anything there. I will look at the chat. I don't see anything new there either. So this, this is your opportunity. I have four, <laughs> three minutes, something like that. Uh, if you have any questions. Yeah. Thanks. Will the slides Thanks. be available? Oh, yes. Awesome. Yes, indeed. They are already available, as a matter of fact. Uh, if you go to uh, fastwonderblog.com and click on the speaking link, I just uploaded the slides there uh, just a couple hours ago. So the slides are, are available for you now. Any other questions? Thoughts, color commentary, things you want to share. We have a couple of minutes left together. Those of you who know me know I tend to just try to egg people on until I get more questions. Uh, so that's what I'll continue to do. I'll just awkwardly talk and see what kind of questions. VMware and open source in five words, you're gonna make me count and think at the same time. Wow, Jen, you, that, that's a little rough. Um, I would say, uh, let's see. Contribution, community, innovation, participation, and good corporate citizen, which is all one word, interestingly enough. Uh, we do try to be good corporate citizens. We have a really detailed um, internal best practices documentation that we provide to all of our employees to try to make sure that they have the resources and the information so that when they participate in open source communities, either our projects or third party projects, that they're doing so in a way that, you know, looks looks good as a VMware as an employer, but also, you know, makes them make them look good. They're doing the right thing for the for the project. And that good corporate citizen thing, I, I used to do a whole talk on that um, last year. Uh, it's something that I, I feel pretty pretty passionate about. It's something that um, you know there's this there's this weird dynamic between individuals, um, companies, and communities that you get within these open source projects. And I do really think that um, having a being able to balance those three is really important because at the end of the day, what you have to do is generally the right thing for the community, which may or may not be uh, what your company really really wants you to do. Um, which can be hard. I mean, I've, I've left companies over this, right? It's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a tough balance to draw. But I do think that, you know, as, as individuals working on behalf of companies within communities, we really do need to put the communities first and do the right thing for them if we want to have good, healthy projects. <laughs>